I first saw this Morg guy on TJ Kirk's channel when he responded to Morg's video denouncing science as the new irrational religion. Since then I've had a look through some of his videos and I've got to say, this guy is the embodiment of the phrase, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Today we'll take a look at a video of his called The Soul Equation, where, as you can probably imagine, Morg claims to have figured out the exact equation of your soul, existence, and everything. Now, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that he has an extremely high likelihood of not knowing what the fuck he's talking about, but I found this video really interesting. Pseudoscience isn't really my thing, but I am well versed on a lot of the theoretical concepts about the nature of the universe and reality that can be interpreted in a variety of ways. For example, did you know that last year, a group of physicists proposed a theory that the universe we live in exists in a sort of binary system with another universe in which time itself flows in the opposite direction to this one, but everything else is 100% identical? Or how about the parallel universe theory, also known as the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics? This has given rise to the idea that multiple universes exist in quantum space, as quantum objects that are capable of interacting with each other and physically affecting each other through collisions. I really like both of these theories, and I've spent time entertaining them and trying to conceptualize the implications of things like this on our perception of reality itself. But at the same time, I fully acknowledge that we have absolutely no way of proving or really knowing if any of these theories are true, and even if we could, given our size in relation to the sheer magnitude of the universe or possible multiverse, us knowing any of this means literally nothing. This Morg character gets pretty deep into the theoretical frameworks or philosophical models relating to the universe and existence, so I'll be acting as your guide through a lot of this. My goal here is to tell you what's more or less correct, although correct might not be the best word to use when you're talking about theories, and what is just him trying to push his own version of mysticism, his masticism. And we'll have a little fun with this. You see, the universe is mathematical. All existent things are based on logic and reason. And that applies to everything. Your soul has nothing to do with faith or an external god. We are completely opposed to these irrational and dangerous concepts. Let's clear up what the word soul means, because that word comes with so much baggage. In a philosophical sense, the soul and your mind are the same thing. The great philosopher Hegel used the word Geist, and this word means both mind and spirit. So when we say soul, don't think of some airy-fairy religious concept, but instead think of it as the part of you that allows you to experience reality. It's your subjectivity. It's your mind. What Morg is talking about here is a philosophical idea of how to conceptualize and rationalize the self. He's referring to the mind, the soul, our consciousness, whatever you want to call it. Morg has chosen to refer to it as a soul for this video, which isn't a natural descriptor for me. I will likely refer to it as the conscious mind, which is how I typically refer to it. So if you see me switching back and forth between his soul and my conscious mind, just know that I'm talking about the same thing. In a rational reality, there is no room for faith, miracles, or a creator God. Everything must be rigorously defined by mathematics. Your eternal mind, your soul, is governed by the soul equation, and that equation is e to the i x equals cosine x plus i sine x. Well, not really. First about the creator bit. If you're talking about the idea of an anthropomorphized god that exists in many mono and polytheistic religions as ethereal beings that are merely gods in a world of men, then I'd have to agree with you that our universe provides no evidence of their existence and no gray area in which they might exist. However, if you're going to talk about existence in its totality, then there exists an imperceivable reality beyond the confines of this universe that is undeniable and whose laws and behavior are undefined to us. There may very well be some kind of entity beyond that created by and within the perceivable universe. The quantum mechanical rules that govern quantum space outside of the universe, or even it's imperceivable. You don't know enough and will never know enough about the nature of reality to draw such a conclusion about reality itself. Now about this soul equation, you have made a massive claim here that sounds silly to say the least but I am expecting you to provide a well-reasoned hypothesis on how and why Euler's formula governs the soul. This is the ultimate eternal equation that governs your soul and existence itself. This equation is called the Euler's formula. Here is what it looks like graphed onto a complex plane. It's a perfect circle. Of course it makes a perfect circle. 
it's basically the function for a unit circle in terms of E and I being viewed down the Y axis instead of a perpendicular Z axis. It doesn't do anything other than make a unit circle. This behavior is not special in any way and is exactly what you would expect if you assign the output of sine to one axis and cosine to a perpendicular axis. I really hope you have something of value to say. The physicist Richard Feynman called this equation our jewel and the most remarkable, almost astounding formulas in all of mathematics. When the equation is evaluated at pi, the mathematician Benjamin Pierce said, Gentlemen, that is surely true. It is absolutely paradoxical. We cannot understand it, and we don't know what it means, but we have proved it, and therefore we know it is the truth. This equation, which has been known as Euler's formula, has been staring the people of this world in the face for hundreds of years, and yet they have been unable to understand its meaning. We are here to show you that this equation the sole equation is the answer to existence itself. Morg is using these quotes to try to make Euler's formula seem to have more significance than it actually does, and it comes across as being really stupid because all he's quoting here are a bunch of nerds being nerds. Now, don't get me wrong, Euler's formula is fantastic. If you're someone who delves into theoretical mathematics, or pure mathematics as it's called, this is the kind of thing that gets you moist, okay? Euler's formula is poetic in the sense that it is one of many grand achievements of a marvelously rational mind, executing alongside the theoretical framework of mathematics to perfection. Looking at Euler's identity, it is remarkably profound from the perspective of a mathematician in its symbolism, because it's an identity composed of the five most important numbers in mathematics. 0, 1, e, i, and pi. What Morg is referring to with these quotes is a bunch of nerds having a nerdgasm. That's all it is. And it certainly doesn't add any credibility to his claim that Euler's formula is the sole equation. Now let's take a look at exactly what it means. Everything in reality is based on waves. Matter is just an illusion. Quantum mechanics shows this clearly. Einstein said, concerning matter, we have all been wrong. What we have called matter is energy, whose vibration has been so lowered as to be perceptible to the senses. There is no matter. Okay, so, about this Einstein quote, and I'm almost certain that he didn't say that, but let's just assume for a second that he did. That's not true. Energy is not a distinct entity. It is just a property of an object. This is why Einstein's equation is E equals mc squared, which means that the total energy of an object at rest in joules is equal to the mass of that object multiplied with the speed of light squared. Atoms are one of the smallest building blocks of visible matter that just about everyone knows of, and they are not made of energy. Atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, which are all particles that have mass. Electrons orbit around an atom, while the nucleus of atoms is composed of protons and neutrons in some configuration. And this is the important part, because it takes a very large amount of energy to keep those neutrons and protons bound together. Now, think about E equals mc squared. You take a huge unstable atom, and then fire a proton into it, causing it to split. The two child nuclei, as well as some stray neutrons, go flying, and a huge amount of energy is released. But the total amount of energy never changes. That's the base premise for an atomic bomb. Now there is an entirely different process that also causes matter to release its stored energy, and it's called annihilation. It's a very bleak sounding name that isn't 100% accurate. You see, annihilation is what happens when matter collides with its equivalent antimatter. Both the matter and the antimatter particles become something other than what they originally were. Some people look at this as the particles simply disappearing, and the only thing being left behind is the energy from both particles before they disappeared. This is wrong, and it gets us onto the issue that I think Morg is making here. Mass and energy are the same thing. Particles, however, are objects, and particles have energy. The energy of a particle can either be observed as mass, momentum, or a combination of the two. And this is where the photon comes into play. Photons are a type of particle that have no mass. All of their energy is momentum. So when annihilation occurs for certain kinds of particles, let's say an electron and its antimatter equivalent, the positron. When these two meet at low energy, they will annihilate. And the resulting particles will be two photons. 
They have no mass, but still will have the exact same amount of energy that the electron and the positron had to begin with. This is why matter is not energy, because particles themselves are not energy. Energy is just a property that all particles have. This is also why matter is not an illusion. If anything, energy is the illusion because energy itself is relative. But I am not about to get into thermodynamics for this. I have already gone far too deep into a topic I shouldn't even have to explain to this guy who supposedly has all the answers. According to quantum mechanics, everything is described by a wave function, even you and I. So for example, you wouldn't refer to an elephant, but instead to the elephant wave function. All matter is an illusion. All that exists are waves, frequency, vibration, energy. This all refers to the exact same concept. By Fourier mathematics, any wave, no matter how complicated it is, can be expressed as a combination of simple waves, of sines and cosines. All this means is that you can build something complicated out of something simple. Like you can build a house out of bricks. The house is complicated, the bricks are simple, but the house is made up of the bricks. I'm sorry, where did you read this exactly? Was it the scientific journal of shit that didn't happen? Everything is not described by a wave function in quantum mechanics. There is no elephant wave function. You seem to be conflating two separate ideas, which are matter waves and the wave particle duality. Matter waves stem from the fact that all matter can exhibit wave-like behavior. The most common example of this is sound. When you make a sound, for example striking a cymbal or a flagpole to have them resonate, you're making both the object and the air surrounding that object behave like a wave. Sound waves themselves aren't separate entities either. The air itself is undulating thousands of times per second to carry that sound to your ears. And your ears then undulate and exhibit wave-like behavior as well. And the same is true for any object that sound can travel through. Your walls, your floors, any part of your own body even. Now, for the wave-particle duality. I just refreshed everyone on atoms, right? They're made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Well, based on our current understanding of the universe, Electrons are different from protons and neutrons in that electrons are what's known as an elementary particle. What this means is that as we understand it, there is no smaller particle that electrons are comprised of. Protons and neutrons, however, are composite particles, which are composed of even smaller particles called quarks, and these quarks are held together by particles called gluons. Quarks and gluons are elementary particles, just like the electron. The thing about elementary particles is that they are particles that at all times have wave-like behavior. In fact, waves and particles aren't really a dichotomy at all. Now, I'm not going to get too deep into this, but just know that saying that we're made of waves is complete nonsense. We are made of particles. He would be more correct if he instead wanted to say we're made of strings, because at least then you could have a basis in string theory, which is kind of getting too deep into this. But anyways. With everything I've just said to you over the past 10 or so minutes, the premise of this video has been completely destroyed, and I'm not even 4 minutes into the video itself. But in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't even matter. There is no logic to the things that this man says. He just bounces back and forth asserting things with no clear reasoning behind anything he presents to you. And so, this is pretty much the end of this video. Now, I have a long shit post that basically picks up where this video leaves off and is a good 15 minutes long. I was going to include it in this, but I figure it's better saved as its own video because I am just not taking anything this man says seriously. It's nowhere near the standard of what I usually do, so, so I want to hear back from you guys. Do you think that this video is something I should upload? I will play this video out with a select portion of my shitposting video, and you guys let me know. <laughs> Reality is defined by zero by nothingness. It cannot be defined by anything else because if it was, it would need something to get it started, to get it going. Zero is perfect balance. It is eternal and it needs nothing because it is nothing. A meaningless effort. One who knows nothing can understand nothing. Some of the ancients on this planet have gotten close to this concept, but they have disastrously used stories instead of precise mathematics, which has resulted in confusion, misunderstanding, death, and chaos, which is why we are completely opposed to mainstream religion.
Yes, that thing that we're opposed to is very, very, very close to the thing we're talking about right now, but, but it's wrong because reasons, because zero, because nothing, nothing. Your immaterial mind, your soul exists outside of space-time in the immaterial domain of pure mind. This is known as the Fourier frequency domain. What the actual fuck are you talking about? A Fourier frequency domain is a way of viewing a waveform that is essentially a graph based on the wave's frequency rather than time. You are as bad as the flat earthers who believe that the azimuthal projection of the planet Earth is what the Earth actually looks like. It is the zeroth dimension. It is dimensionless. But the interactions of these sine and cosine waves give rise to the material world of space-time. All of matter is composed of the wave combinations of all the minds in existence. But these minds, these souls, exists outside of space-time. Hold on, hold on. Let me stop you right there. I just want to make sure I'm following along, okay? Okay. So your supposition here is that souls exist outside of space-time and they can't interact with space-time because they're just, they're just they're not even there. But the interaction of these souls creates matter in space-time that the souls can't interact with, but their interactions interact with. This man is a fucking genius. Within the mental frequency singularity, material bodies are complicated wave structures that are generated by these sine and cosine combinations. Your mind, your soul, which exists outside of space-time, can link to a physical body in order to interact in the domain of space-time. So what you're telling me is, my soul can't interact with space-time, except for this one time when it does, but that's different. And my soul, while not interacting with space-time, interacts with space-time by interacting with other souls to create matter in space-time. The true nature of reality has been hidden from you by the rulers of this world, the rich elite, so that you will be easy to control. It's time you begin to realize what you are, where you are, and why you are here. Does it involve bees? Because I don't like bees. We have shown you the equation of your soul, Euler's formula. The mathematician Keith Devlin said, Like a Shakespearean sonnet that captures the very essence of love, or a painting that brings out the beauty of the human form that is far more than just skin deep. I got it. Reality is an advertisement for Dove Body Wash. Euler's equation reaches down into the very depths of existence. You are an eternal soul, a mind, and you don't need faith, you don't need crazy religious nonsense, and you don't need some god in the sky. We reject all of these irrational concepts. All you need is the perfect, infallible, and rational laws of mathematics. That I don't actually understand, and I'm hoping you don't either. Once you begin to understand these laws, a whole new world will be revealed before you. The world of Algebra 2. This summer. You are so much more than what this world tells you. One man's goal to find the truth. And you are more powerful than you can imagine. Can only be stopped by one thing. Ad Astra. Two of the stars. Complete. Zero is a container for infinite energy and total. Now your soul is an infinite number of these points. Bullshit. It is the zeroth dimension. It is dimensionless. Welcome to Hyperionism, the movie, the book, the game, based on the best-selling novel.